My pleasure is the next speaker. He's currently a distinguished professor. Good He's currently a distinguished professor at UPenn. A graduate of Cornell, trained at Harvard. It's a great honor to have you here. It's really finish. Great. So uh, thank you, Dr. Akai, for the kind introduction um, and for the conference organizers um, at the university for having us. So I know it's the end of the day, so I'll try to keep this uh, quick. Um, so Professor City brought up a great point at the end about developing these micro and nano devices and how they engage in the immune system. And for certain applications, we have to avoid this. Uh, what I'll talk a little bit about today is actually the opposite for nanotech, for how do we actually engage the immune system um, as a new means of treating cancer. So rather than developing a nanotech to target the tumor cells, can we target immune cells in the blood to now engage them to target these sites? Um, so that's one um, portion of what my lab works on. Broadly what we work on is how do we engineer materials, polymers and lipids, uh, that can deliver genetic therapeutics into target tissues and into target cells within the body. Uh, so what I show here is a very basic example of how this works. Here's an example on the left of a nanoparticle that can contain some sort of genetic material. And when we deliver it into the body via various mechanisms, we want to have it target various sites. So here's an example of a nanoparticle that might go to the lymph node. Um, and when they go to these lymph nodes, they can then train immune cells in the body to then leave those sites and then target tumors. Um, so we work on these kind of problems in terms of drug delivery, nucleic acid delivery, and it broadly falls under immunotherapy, um, but also genome editing as well. So this concept of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, can we deliver multiple genetic components into a cell and either edit out mutations that contribute to disease or even insert correct versions of these genes using nanotechnology. Um, so nucleic acid therapeutics are becoming a reality now clinically. Um, just this uh, past year in the United States, in 2018, uh, the first lipid nanoparticle RNA drug uh, was approved by Al Island Pharmaceuticals. Um, so this is a lipid nanoparticle that contains small interfering and, uh, siRNA, and this is used right now for the treatment of polyneuropathy uh, for people with hereditary transurethrin-mediated amyloidosis. So basically delivering a particle that can go into your liver and shut down the production of a protein that contributes to amyloid deposits. So this is being used now and FDA approved in the U.S. Um, and since then, we've seen, in, you know, recently as well, not just nanoparticle therapeutics, but also gene therapeutics in various forms being developed in the U.S. Uh, these were both developed uh, out of the University of Pennsylvania. Two gene therapies that were recently approved, Luxterna, uh, which was developed by Spark, which was spun out of a, a technology developed at Penn, which is a gene therapy to correct blindness. And of course, these are still very expensive treatments right now. One injection of Luxterna costs half a million dollars. Uh, the other gene therapy that's being developed now by Novartis is to engineer immune cells outside the body. So this is known as CAR T cell therapy. The trade name is Kimraya. Uh, it's developed by Novartis right now, and the patient will come to University of Pennsylvania, have their blood drawn, and they'll have their cells genetically engineered and then re-injected into their body to eradicate cancer. Um, and in addition to this, in addition to immunotherapy and gene therapy, CRISPR-Cas9 has seen a boom right now uh, with various companies, and these are really kind of some of the, some of the founders of CRISPR-Cas9, Jennifer Doudna, uh, Charpentier, Feng Zhang, and George Church. Uh, and there's companies now that are developing various forms of genome editing systems, whether they're viral or non-viral based nanoparticle systems. So there's a variety of new types of gene and immunotherapies being developed right now, uh, but there's challenges that they face, and primarily delivery obstacles. Um, so when we think about immunotherapy, there's a lot of non-specific effects. So elderly population, if you want to deliver this therapy, it challenges if you overtly engage the immune system and have them target other cells in the body, could that result in the death of a patient? So this is limited to certain portions of the population. There's challenges with genome editing as well. We want to target you know, specific mutations in genes uh, that contribute to disease, but we also don't want off-target effects and deleting out healthy genes. Uh, there's also ethical concerns as well. So this is out of The Economist a few years ago, this idea of genome editing technology 
uh, and the challenges we might face, particularly the moral you know, implications as well. You, know, you could use these technologies very powerfully to get rid of you know, diseased genes, but we've seen recent examples, such as in China, where you have uh, the genes um, in embryos being edited, so there's various concerns there. And what we primarily work on in the lab is how do we use biomaterials and nanotechnology to make these various forms of therapy safer, more targeted, um, so we can deliver these to patients. Um, so I know there's, uh, this is a different audience from the typical you know, polymer lipid biomaterial community, so I just wanted to go over some of the challenges we face in this field. Uh, with nucleic acid delivery to deliver, you know, immunotherapies um, and CRISPR-Cas9. Um, so here's a very basic schematic of how you might make a drug delivery vehicle and then inject it into the bloodstream. First challenge you face whenever you deliver a nucleic acid is if you just have the nucleic acid alone, it's going to get degraded as soon as it goes in the bloodstream. So your bloodstream has these endonucleases that are just programmed to degrade these nucleic acids. In addition to that, you have these phagocytic cells, macrophages, that could also gobble up free nucleic acids. So developing a material that can encapsulate and protect your therapeutic is very important. Uh, in addition to that, these um, particles have to navigate throughout the bloodstream. Uh, they have to go through your vessels and through the matrix, um, and then ultimately reach your cell target. And when they get to that cell target, if you have a nucleic acid alone, it's highly negatively charged, so it's not going to go into the cell membrane, especially something as big as messenger RNA. Uh, so we develop materials that can safely go across, mimic viral delivery, to get into cells without destroying them. So after these cells under, undergo um, endocytosis, they, they reside in these vesicles shown here. And a lot of times when these little small vesicles, these delivery vehicles we're making get into the cell, they become recycled back out. So a challenge in this field is also how do we develop these materials to be environmentally responsive? So ideally we would want something, when we deliver it, becomes highly charged within the cell, so it causes rupture of these endosomes, ultimately to release your nucleic acid therapeutic for an effect. There's various forms of nucleic acid therapeutics. So I brought up immunotherapy um, and CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. Uh, these could take various forms in terms of nucleic acid therapy. You could have small interfering RNA, uh, which I mentioned, uh, which plays a role in protein and gene knockdown. You could also have messenger RNA, where you have the protein being expressed. So if you're developing a vaccine, you might have an mRNA encoding for tumor antigens. Uh, and you could also have a combination of RNA therapeutics. So if you want to achieve genome editing, you might deliver a messenger RNA for your Cas9 protein, uh, but also a smaller RNA to edit out genes within those cells. So in the lab, we have, very similar to Professor City's lab, we have chemists, we have biologists, um, bioengineers, because there's multiple phases when you're taking something from chemistry to cells um, into animals for therapeutic. Um, so a lot of our materials start at this fundamental stage where we develop and discover new types of ionizable materials that can deliver into our cell types of interest. And every cell type is different and every cell membrane has different components. So what we do is we take a high throughput approach to make large libraries of ionizable lipid materials. These can be hundreds or these can be thousands of different materials. Um, the type of chemistry we utilize, Michael addition, is a very simple chemistry technique at high heat and stir. You could rapidly make these different types of lipids that are very different from your traditional amine head and two lipid tails. These branch lipids can be very diverse in their structure and have unique properties. Uh, this simple chemistry technique can be adapted to robots, so you can make this at a high throughput, large scale um, in an industry setting. Um, and these reactions are done in the absence of any harmful solvents or catalysts, therefore enabling you know, this high throughput method to be done within a laboratory setting. Um, so as you can imagine, I had a very basic synthesis scheme here, but you can really expand out these libraries to have different amine heads and different lipid tails so you can make large libraries uh, of these materials. In addition to making the biomaterial within the lab, uh, we also utilize custom designed microfluidics to promote the self assembly in these, of these materials into structures uh, that we can deliver into the bloodstream. 
Uh, so the advantage of using microfluidics to make these lipid-like nanoparticles is it enables rapid assembly, typically within seconds, uh, where you simply mix RNA and your lipid material to form these nanoparticles. Uh, they're very small, well-controlled size, so you can have a very large messenger RNA and condense it into a 60 nanometer particle that can be delivered into the bloodstream. Uh, and these chips are very cheap, PDMS-based as well. Uh, so there's typically two components, so there's the ethanol phase um, and the aqueous phase, which has your RNA within it. Um, so there's multiple components that come together. There's the custom design biomaterial, the lipid that we make within the lab, there's your RNA, but then there's also components of the particle that promote stability, typically a neutral lipid, and also a polymer lipid. So these particles have these hydrophilic polymer polyethylene glycol coatings that allow them to distribute throughout the body. And these are typically what these particles look like. Uh, so they're a little different from your liposome-like structure. These are typically onion-like particles where you have layers of RNA and lipid basically wrapped <laughs> around each other. Um, so, and what are we using these for right now? I'll give one brief example on this. Um, this idea of using mRNA in nanoparticle form as a form of cancer immunotherapy. Um, so here's a basic um, overview of you know, this concept of cancer immunotherapy. There's various um, different forms of immunotherapy that are being explored right now. The example I mentioned here, the CAR T therapy, is where you take the patient's cells out, genetically engineer them, and put them back in. Um, what we're looking at in this project here is rather than having this costly process of taking out the cells and putting them back in, can we deliver a vaccine, this can be preventative or therapeutic, in nanoparticle form to program dendritic cells to then train those T cells to kill these tumors. Um, and here's a, what really needs to go on to get this vaccination approach to happen. So I won't go into this too much in detail, but basically all the delivery barriers that we have, now we need to coordinate with the immune cells and have them produce tumor antigens to coordinate this vaccination response. Uh, so here's what these uh, systems typically look like. So these are the biomaterials that we make into the lab and we formulate them with messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA that we show here can code for various tumor antigens. Um, so in the lab we typically use model tumor antigens to see if we can get this response. And what's nice about these particles is you can encapsulate multiple mRNAs within a single particle. So if you want to vaccinate against multiple antigens, it's possible using a, a messenger RNA nanoparticle platform. So what we do in the lab to screen these approaches are we'll have these particles and we'll look at different types of biomaterials, different lipids, um, and we'll, we'll vaccinate these mice and we'll look for using what the technique known as flow cytometry, looking at antigen-specific T cell response. So here, all these bars are essentially different particles we're looking at, and we're looking at the particle that best produces the number of CD8 T cells that have the antigen that we want. So after you utilize the screening approach, we identify lead candidates and then move forward with those. Um, and what we utilize is a subcutaneous ejection. So rather than delivering the bloodstream in this case, we wanted to see if we can deliver below the skin, um, can we have these particles be taken up by dendritic cells or maybe even filter out into the lymph nodes to deliver messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA we use in this case encodes for luciferase, and luciferase is great for in vivo imaging because you'll get luminescence. Uh, so if we're successfully transfecting these cells, if we image them under IVIS imaging, we should see a bright signal coming from our organs or cells of interest. Um, so it's a little tough to see here, but if you vaccinate these mice and then you take out their lymph nodes, what you'll see here is these lymph nodes are glowing, indicating that there are cells expressing our messenger RNA of interest in vivo. And we could track this luciferase expression over time to see the transfection response. Uh, and here you can see various mice uh, that are dosed with various formulations, and you see this response is long-lived as well. So then after we validate these particles using, you know, essentially a reporter mRNA to see if we could transfect them, uh, we then deliver the therapeutic uh, RNA. And in this case, this encodes for a tumor-associated uh, antigen, and the model antigen used here is OVA. And the reason why we use this is because the melanoma model that's very aggressive that we utilize in mice express this uh, OVA on it. 
Uh, so we can look at um, delivering uh, different types of particles here, or different RNAs, and what you'll see is, going back to what I said, if you deliver the RNA by itself, you don't transfect cells. It's too big, it degrades rapidly, it doesn't get in there. However, when we have uh, a nanoparticle-based system, we're able to transfect about 8% of these cells. Um, and we can look over time at the number of antigen-specific T cells, and then ultimately what we utilize is a very aggressive model of melanoma, where these mice typically die within 20 days. And what we can see is if we deliver the messenger RNA encoding for the tumor antigen shown here in E, we can extend survival in these mice uh, significantly. Uh, what's also nice about this approach, too, is, as I said, you can deliver multiple tumor antigens. Uh, so here we have uh, co-delivery of a messenger RNA for TRP and then GP100. Um, this is possible using a particle-based platform. Uh, and what we could do in these survival models to show when we co-deliver these two antigens, we could extend survival out even more, uh, which is very useful in the case if we need to deliver against multiple antigens in a heterogeneous tumor microenvironment. Uh, and then in addition into that, so the nice thing about these encapsulation technologies, in addition to mRNA, uh, is you could co-deliver other forms of proteins and small molecules as well. Uh, so what we also delivered in an experiment was a lipopolysaccharide, and it, this is essentially acts as an adjuvant for vaccination. So this will promote the secretion of cytokines and induce a more potent anti-tumor response. Uh, and what we're able to show here is if we look essentially at this last figure here in C, uh, if we look at the different particle formulations and then we compare it to the particle that also co-encapsulates this adjuvant, we could enhance this vaccination response out further. So it really makes it for a versatile platform where we cannot even deliver multiple mRNAs encoding for different antigens, but we could also deliver adjuvant as well to further boost this response. Um, so I'll end with one quick note on, you know, where we kind of see things going um, in the immunotherapy field. So again, Professor City had mentioned these micro nanosystems, understanding the immune response. Um, when we're thinking about cancer therapeutics, um, the past few decades, people have really looked at this in the nanospace. You know, can we deliver a particle? Can we get it into the tumor? Um, for a while, it was thought that these tumors are very leaky and nanoparticles will collect there. A lot of this was an artifact of mouse models. Some tumors are leaky and some particles do collect in certain tumors, but they're very heterogeneous. So a lot of patients have not seen what's known as this EPR effect with this leaky vasculature. Um, so hopefully, I think what we'll see in the nanospace, uh, which is ongoing now and continuing further, is uh, rather than delivering a lot of these particles into the tumor microenvironment, maybe we could have a lot of these particle platforms either hitchhike onto immune cells in the blood or within the skin or you know, other types of immunotherapy approaches where we don't have to target the tumor itself, but now we leverage the immune system to deliver our nanobase system. Um, and this is some of the group, uh, we're a new group, uh, we started about a year ago, um, and we've been very fortunate uh, for support from different mechanisms like the New Innovator Award from the NIH, which supports uh, young investigators. Uh, thank you, I'd love to take any questions.